Hello, my name is uh, Daniel Tyland. I'm the director of the Center for Human Rights and Environment, an NGO that was originally founded in Argentina in 1999, and we moved to the United States uh, for political reasons, among others, in 2015. So we've been in Florida now uh, for three years almost, a little bit more. Uh, we would like to speak to you today about fracking uh, and specifically about uh, some recent work that we've done to look at emissions from the oil and gas sector that have to do with fracking, but also with conventional oil and gas, and the impacts that these emissions have on communities, uh, and also a little bit about the technology that we've uh, utilized to register these emissions and the implications uh, that, they, uh, that they entail, not only because this is something relatively new, but because this is something that uh, really is occurring across the sector and all around the world. And it, we think that it's very important that uh, individuals that are engaged on fracking issues and oil and gas more generally uh, should be taking up. Um, the Center for Human Rights and Environment has worked for several decades now on bridging the, the human rights and environment fields. We've worked on things like climate change, corporate accountability, mining impacts, uh, right to water, these have been some of the central focuses of our work. Uh, we've been more engaged recently on glacier protection and oil and gas specifically, in large part because in Argentina, a very big shale play was discovered a few years back called Vaca Muerta or the dead cow. And this is creating quite a bit of controversy in Argentina. And we've been engaged on, on some of the issues that are uh, related to this, to this topic. And I'm happy to begin if you're ready to go. The, uh, the title of the presentation is called The Human Rights Impact of Unchecked Emissions from the Oil and Gas Sector. Uh, it's uh, prepared by myself this, at the Center for Human Rights and Environment. And I would like to, to suggest and, and to inform you that parts of this presentation uh, come from uh, Priscilla Villa and Pete Dronkers of Earthworks, with whom we've uh, done a lot of the field work that is included in the presentation, and by Jonathan Banks, who's uh, provided some of the technical information uh, about methane impacts in, in uh, in the oil and gas sector. Uh, we have four central questions, which you are already familiar with, so I won't spend time going over them. Um, but uh, in, to conclude, uh, before we begin on some of the main elements that we will speak about um, in this presentation, our ongoing field work that has begun recently has revealed systematic uh, and very significant emissions leaks from conventional and non-conventional oil and gas operations. Uh, this, these are emissions or leaks that neither government nor industry monitors. Uh, generally, there's no data collected regarding these leaks. And in most cases, the companies and the governments are not conducting any repairs uh, or uh, taking any action to stop these leaks and avoid them in the future. In some cases, the leaks are fugitive emissions, which we would consider emissions that uh, are not intended. Maybe it's a, it's a loose pipe or some, some joint that is leaking or a part of the um, equipment that is leaking and is uh, emitting these emissions to the atmosphere. In other cases, uh, it may be that the, uh, that the leaks or the emissions are actually intentionally emitted into the atmosphere. And this has to do, in most cases, with outdated technology or, or the very system utilized by the oil and gas industry, which incorporates uh, moments of leakage or emissions uh, into the atmosphere. In the cases that we've looked at, these leaks or emissions are highly toxic, both to human health uh, and are very impacting to the atmosphere, accelerating climate change tendencies as we know them today. And for these reasons, uh, they are very particular to this uh, presentation. Uh, a summary of our findings before we move forward, and we'll come back to these issues during the presentation. The emissions, or the leaks in this case, are placing the human rights of workers of the industry, the people that work on these sites, and nearby residents at great risk. Uh, they are affecting their human right to a healthy environment, their right to life, their right to health, and their right to information, because in most cases, few people or no people know about these leaks. The severity of the leaks of these emissions from the sector uh, absolutely warrant provisional measures. They can be stopped. Uh, we must work to stop these toxic fugitive emissions, particularly because we can do it and it's possible to do. Uh, and it, they, they require companies to take steps to monitor, measure, and more importantly, to cease these emissions. And they require governments to intervene to protect communities and force companies to comply with the law and reduce or even fully eliminate these emissions 
um, and also to provide information about the emissions, uh, past, present, and future to communities. Companies are absolutely liable. They are fully aware of these fugitive emissions, and they, yet they do nothing to curtail them or to cease them. Uh, states are liable, as they should be enforcing emission standards and ensuring that companies are not allowing fugitive emissions or placing communities and workers at risk. And knowing that these fugitive emissions, particularly methane gas, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the presentation, are many more times destructive to the atmosphere, uh, even up to 100 or more times impacting than CO2 in terms of their climate impact, and particularly because of recent uh, agreements signed by many governments, such as the Montreal Protocol or the Paris Agreement to reduce these emissions, uh, states are responsible for the climate's impacts that are caused by these emissions, particularly if they're not doing anything. Quickly, uh, to look at a fracking site and some of the uh, areas or equipment that might be emitting that we've looked at uh, with the technology that we'll get into in, in a moment. Uh, this may occur at a fracking tower that's actually conducting fracking. Uh, it could occur at a water storage facility or produce water facility, as you see in the back right of the image, in condensation tanks, in drilling and fracking equipment and trucks. Uh, it could uh, also exist in, in infrastructure used for compressing gas, which is not in this image. And these emissions include methane, but also may include volatile organic compounds, such as NOx or or particulate matter, or CO2, or black carbon. These are all very toxic emissions uh, that are not good for people and not good for the environment. And in the case of methane, certainly not good uh, to prevent climate change. Uh, they, these emissions occur at traditional oil and gas well pads. They occur in flaring. They occur in compressors and gas processing plants, in transmission equipment and storage equipment, and in distribution. Inside cities, outside of cities, at uh, oil and gas sites, wherever they may be. Oil and gas uh, is the number one industrial source of methane pollution, uh, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. It is also a major source of toxic emissions that lead to ozone smog and fine particulate pollution, making them also very concerning uh, to human health and to the environment. Uh, methane, for those that have uh, looked a little bit into it, uh, has a very high global warming potential, up to 100 or more times more than CO2. In the near term, and this is especially important for taking action, in the near term, it has a much higher impact than in the long term. And this means that dealing with methane leakages and stopping them in the short term can be extremely important to avoid immediate impacts to, to our climate. Uh, it could have a very, very large effect, positive effect, if we are able to reduce these methane leakages in the short term. Uh, and some of the scenarios looking forward uh, into the many decades to come uh, the targets that we have at a global level to keep uh, global climate change and warming to 1.5% really depends on addressing short-life climate pollutants, of which methane is one. So we really need to, to include short-life climate pollutants in this reduction if we want to reach uh, global uh, climate change um, mitigation uh, objectives and, and targets. The International Energy Agency recently found that around 40 to 50% of current methane emissions could be avoided at no net cost, and 75% of the emissions can be cut at reasonable cost. This is a very important point, especially if we're considering intervention or legal intervention in the sector. Actually addressing these emissions is very viable, it's very feasible, uh, the technology exists, and it's not expensive for, uh, for the industry. Uh, in fact, addressing these emissions can actually save the industry money and even generate a profit. So not addressing uh, methane leaks is, uh, it just does not make business sense. And if it's also providing a climate benefit and reducing impacts to people in, in, in terms of the, not only methane, but other emissions that are, that are emitted as well, then uh, it's a win-win situation for, for everyone. Uh, the oil and gas industry releases a wide range of chemicals that are known or probable carcinogens. This is uh, in addition to methane. Remember that methane is not necessarily uh, a chemical that's impacting human health. Although if we were to, uh, to breathe a lot of methane, then we would have uh, respiratory problems in terms of uh, lack of oxygen. But the real problems here, um, the immediate problems are uh, the car carcinogens that are also emitted alongside of, of methane. These air pollutants are either emitted as a component of raw natural gas or a byproduct of natural gas combustion, 
that occurs at these sites. And studies based on air measurements have identified elevated levels of benzene, of hydrogen sulfide, of formaldehyde near oil and gas sites. In fact, if you visited oil and gas sites, sometimes you uh, smell rotten egg smell. This is common in these areas. And this is, uh, of course, coming from these, these emissions that are occurring. Uh, benzene has been linked to cancer. Uh, ethylbenzene is, is associated with respiratory and eye irritation, hydrogen sulfide. It's found generally near wells producing sour gas and at high concentrations, it can cause severe respiratory irritation and even death. We know of cases of people that work at oil and gas sites that have been exposed to some of these emissions and have died on the spot um, because they've, they've breathed in uh, very, very large amounts of these gases. Um, the oil and gas industry dumps millions of tons of methane and other pollutants uh, like Vox into our air each year. Uh, pollutants from the oil and gas supply chain contribute to the formation of ozone or smog pollution, which blankets many world cities in the warmer months. And Vox and methane vented and leaked from the oil and gas supply chain and nitrogen oxides formed by gas flaring and engines at natural gas facilities react together in the presence of sunlight to form ozone smog. Uh, so these are just some of the problems that, uh, that are related to these emissions. Uh, when inhaled, ozone can impair lung function, trigger asthma attacks, and aggravate conditions of people with bronchitis and emphysema, in some cases leading to premature death. Children, the elderly, and people with existing respiratory conditions are most at risk from ozone smog pollution. And of course, if you work at these sites and you're there uh, day after day, you are also uh, extremely vulnerable. Fine particle pollution um, in CO2 emissions are also extremely uh, significant in the sector, not only uh, from, from some of this equipment, but also from, from the trucks and the transport uh, of these chemicals and, uh, and agents as they go in and out of, of oil and gas operations. Um, uh, this is a, a slide that suggests that a lot of these impacts uh, are actually disproportionate for minorities and uh, affect, uh, for example, Native Americans or other poor communities more so than they would richer communities. Um, some of the things that we can do to address uh, these emissions impacts, uh, certainly detect leaks. You know, this is something that is lacking in the sector for many, many decades. The sector has simply allowed these leaks to occur, has not even uh, included uh, efforts to stop the leakage or doesn't really even understand the volume of the leakages. I spoke recently to the head of research of Argentina's uh, primary oil and gas company and asked him about methane leakages from industry and his answer, which was uh, quite comical, was what leakage? Now they, they in, in many cases, don't even know that this is occurring because there aren't systems in place uh, to measure them. Uh, certainly companies and states should be working to eliminate or minimize venting. Uh, they should prioritize a capture of gas, not the flaring of gas. Uh, minimize flaring, capture, reuse, recycle, uh, and, and send to market. Uh, diesel engines, engines that are used in the process should have pollution controls. There should be a regular monitoring measurements and reports as well as verification by third parties to make sure that our objectives are being met in terms of mitigation, reduction, and uh, elimination. Regardless of the emission source, there's almost always a cost-effective regulatory path, which few countries have taken, but which more and more are now beginning to embark on. Um, states like Colorado, California, and others in the United States, or also Canadian states, and even uh, trade agreements like NAFTA are beginning to address methane leakage from oil and gas and to establish commitments of reducing these emissions uh, as part of their climate change strategies or simply as part of their environmental objectives uh, to clean up uh, dirty industries. Uh, states and companies around the world have recognized the problem and are moving in the right direction uh, to address these leakages. And now we get to some of the advocacy work on the ground, which is really what I wanted to show you uh, because it, it really has been stunning in our own experience, along with some of our partners and local communities over the past year, have really changed our own perspective and knowledge about these, uh, about these issues. And it's really the, the material that we would like to present today. And it begins with something called a FLIR technology. It's a handheld camera that looks a bit like an old video recorder, but that little guy, uh, when, you, when you power it on, it drops to about 250 degrees below zero and has a very highly sensitive um, 
sensor that is able to capture gases uh, in the atmosphere. Now, this is not a heat sensing camera. It actually is able to detect some 20 different gases uh, of which methane, benzene, and xylene, and toluene, and, and others are part. Uh, and just by holding it in your hand and pointing it at, uh, at infrastructure, you're able to see uh, emissions. Uh, the FLIR GF320 is a camera we used in, in the two field visits that we did in Mexico and Argentina. This is state-of-the-art technology utilized not only by us in this case, but it's the common industry uh, technology utilized by industry to measure uh, methane leakages. Few countries have these in, in, the, uh, in their institutions that are doing controls, but more and more companies now have this technology to detect methane leakages. Uh, they detect volatile organic compounds as well as methane gas. The price of the camera, which is quite prohibitive, is about $150,000, and that would make it quite uh, prohibitive for NGOs, for example, and this is something that we're working on to try to get these, uh, these cameras and this technology into the hands of local communities that are uh, engaged with the oil and gas sector. If, if you look at some of these images, you'll see right away what we're talking about. Uh, the image on the right, uh, this is in Colorado, right next to a school uh, where a fracking tower exists. Uh, when you look at it, uh, if you were to walk up to, to the site, you would see absolutely nothing. Uh, but if you put on the, the, the camera, turn it on and point it to the tower, you'll immediately see uh, voluminous quantities of gas right next to the, to the fracking tower. This is a plume of emissions that is going into the atmosphere right around the school and the local neighborhood. Uh, this is an image taken in Mexico in October of 2017. We went down to Veracruz and looked at about 15 different sites belonging to Pemex, the country's uh, main and practically only uh, oil and gas company. And if you look at those tanks, and this is a photo taken at the very moment, uh, right as we were turning on the camera, you see absolutely no emissions. But a moment later, with the camera on, you can see the copious amounts of emissions coming right out of the tanks. Now, the, this looks like steam, but these are actually gases. There could be methane gas, there could be a volatile organic compounds in the plume of emissions coming from uh, the top of those two storage facilities. Uh, this is an image taken in Neuquén, uh, Patagonia, Argentina. This is where the Vaca Muerta oil play, oil and gas shale play is located. In, and there we have the operator um, uh, with a local community member looking through the camera, pointing at the, um, the storage facility and showing emissions. Uh, if you look at the right image, you can see the emissions coming right out of the tank. Uh, in the next image, another tank in a joint venture operation by uh, Oldeval and YPF, Argentina's state-owned company. Again, you see absolutely no emissions at the tank. If you were to visit the site, you would think it was, uh, it was very clean and working in great condition. But when you look through the viewfinder of the FLIR camera, you immediately see the, the uh, plume of smoke coming from the exhaust uh, pipes. Now, this is one of those cases where the very technology uh, of the industry, if you, if you look closely at the, at the image, and you may not see it very well, there are two little yellow dots right on top of the tank. Those are the, vent, the venting pipes uh, that are designed to leak these emissions right into the, uh, into the atmosphere. In, mo in modern technology, in state-of-the-art technology, you would not have these, uh, these vents going directly into the atmosphere. Another site uh, in the Vaca Muerta uh, shale play, uh, very, very large amounts of emissions coming from these uh, three or four tanks that you see there at the end. If you look closely, you'll see in the middle of the image towards the bottom, a worker is walking right next to the tanks. Uh, no gas mask or anything else uh, to avoid breathing in the emissions coming from the tanks. Uh, another tank in also in Neuquén, Argentina. Here you see the two vent uh, pipes again right at the top. They're more uh, they're more visible. This is outdated technology that should not be used uh, where they vent directly into the atmosphere. Here you have the plume coming out of the tanks. Extremely in, extremely intense. This is one of the worst tanks that we saw. Uh, you can see how in the image there's a, a a dark and a light part of the tank. The, the camera is actually able to see where the fluid is inside the tank without having to go into the tank uh, by the, the temperature reading. Um, and you can see in the more sensitive uh, registration of this image how big that plume is. And if you were actually to look at it blowing down wind, 
it was about a mile and a half long. I put a map here to show the location where we did the filming and a town that is nearby that's only two kilometers away. It is the exact same direction as the plume of smoke that you saw in the previous image. Um, one thing that I'd like to, to stress, and I'm, I'm coming almost to a close of my presentation, is the importance of sharing this information uh, with local communities. What, what you see in the image, and you'll see a, a gentleman with a beret sitting behind a table um, right next to his little home uh, in a rural part of Patagonia. This is Mr. Molina. He's 92 years old. He's been living at this location uh, for about 50 years, and he tells us uh, he's, he's been there since the oil and gas sector showed up. Uh, he lived there previously to its arrival. And since its arrival, he's noticed uh, foul smells near his home, a deterioration in the quality of the plant life around his home, uh, death of his animals. He has trouble sleeping at night, uh, constant headaches. And this is the first time that these people have been told about the emissions coming from this plant. Now, Mr. Molina also happens to be a member of the Mapuche indigenous tribe. He is a leader of his tribe, and several of the people in the image are also leaders that had come out to listen to our, to our presentation and actually accompany us to the sites. And I like this, there's Mr. Molina with his family uh, again and some of the indigenous leaders. His granddaughter is the, the girl in the, in the black shirt and she has taken up um, much of the advocacy and will be a leader, a Mapuche leader in the future uh, in this area. What's very interesting is when you put these, this technology in the hands of the local community. This is another uh, tribe leader, a different part of the country there, who, who went with us and who also for many years has been visiting these sites and didn't realize that there were emissions coming uh, from the equipment. And he is looking through the floor camera, you can see how easy it is to, to operate, uh, and looking at some of uh, the emissions coming. The, the woman to his right is our colleague from Earthworks, and right behind her is another indigenous leader that went with us. Uh, here is Pete Drunkers of Earthworks, uh, who operates the camera, and I will say Mr. Drunkers is a certified technician. When you buy this $150,000 camera, uh, it comes with a training. So uh, Mr. Dronkers actually went to the FLIR training, which took about a week, and he is an authorized and uh, knowledgeable user of this camera, and his testimony is actually valid in, uh, in court. So if you were to register these emissions, or if he were to register these emissions, they could be used as testimony, and he is an authorized uh, expert to be able to interpret the data. So we, we know from his training and his use of the camera that what we were looking at was actually toxic emissions. Uh, here he is showing other community members uh, how the camera works and showing them, uh, showing them the emissions coming from the various facilities. You, you also see around his neck uh, a little indicator uh, that is used in cases where toxic emissions are so strong that you shouldn't actually be walking around near the facilities. He carries that at all times because in some cases, it has gone off and that suggests to him that he needs to move away quickly from the facility. Here is another uh, picture that for us is extremely important. These are two workers in the blue helmets that actually came up to us uh, while we were filming. They were extremely curious as to what we were doing. They, they weren't actually operators of the equipment. They were workers that were uh, digging trenches and doing different types of public works uh, right around those, uh, those three tanks that you see there in the background. And they had no idea that they were being exposed to these emissions. They had no knowledge of how these equipment works. They simply do works 24 seven all the time around these facilities uh, whenever they're called to do so. And they are being exposed. So one of the things that we'd like to talk about is the, the right, the human right to health and to life of the very workers that have to be at these facilities all the time. If you look underneath the image, uh, there is a FLIR registration of the emissions coming out from those tanks at the exact moment that we're looking through that camera. So you can see the copious amounts of emissions coming uh, from the towers. Another indigenous leader uh, who lives downwind from this facility, uh, this is a processing plant where they compress gas. And you can see in the image, no smoke. But if you look to the right, it looks almost as if it were on fire. And this is uh, also the camera 
able to capture emissions as they are occurring at the facility. And this is the facility that operates 24 seven. Behind him is a local leader from a, an NGO uh, that works with the community on, on various issues related to oil and gas. So to summarize uh, the human rights impacts, uh, and, and this is getting to the end and to the conclusion of this presentation. Fugitive or intentional emissions from the oil and gas operations pl place human rights of workers of the industry and nearby residents at great risk. It affects their human rights to a healthy environment, their right to health, right to life, and their right to information, uh, particularly because in most cases, communities are completely unaware that this is going on. The right of information is violated by companies that knowingly do not provide information about these emissions uh, and, and or the resulting impacts and risks that workers and communities face. The severity, or in some cases, the potential severity, if they are lesser, uh, of fugitive or intentional emissions from the oil and gas sector can be extremely harmful to human health, causing a range of impacts, including skin, eye and respiratory problems, long-term cancer affectations, and even sudden death, as cases that uh, we know of have occurred uh, at sites. Testimonials from residents like that of Mr. Molina and workers living, living near oil and gas operations perceive persistent and regular foul odor, odors at or near their homes, which they attribute to the oil and gas sector, but don't always know or can't always prove that it is the sector that is generating them. They indicate also a steady loss of vegetation, a deterioration of their animals and general decline in the quality of their environment, accompanied by problems with sleep, recurrent headaches, cancer amongst their friends, peers and family, etc. In some, some of the human rights that are potentially affected by emissions from oil and gas, uh, the right to life, the right to health, the right to a safe working environment, the right to a healthy environment, the right to information with stress several times, the right to development, right to remedy, you know, this, this needs to be addressed and needs to be resolved. The right to livelihood, as we see the deterioration of, of working and living environments, the right to agriculture, the right to property, the right to culture, the right to land, the right to climate, to atmosphere and to air, the right to self-determination, and in the case uh, that we've seen in Argentina, the rights of indigenous peoples are also uh, greatly affected. Um, so uh, going back now to answer the four questions that were posited by the, um, by the panel, under what circumstances do fracking and other unconventional oil and gas extraction techniques breach human rights protected by international law as a matter of treaty or custom? Well, in part due to the unchecked fugitive emissions or intentional emissions from, um, from the oil and gas operations in fracking, but also in conventional extraction and production. These affect the, the health of workers and communities nearby, as well as the, as the conditions of the atmosphere and the climate. The second question, under what circumstances do fracking and unconventional oil and gas extraction techniques warrant the issuance of either provisional measures, a judgment in joining uh, uh, further activity, remediation, relief, or damages for causing environmental harm? Well, if fugitive emissions are detected, provisional measures should be sought immediately to cease production, to oblige a company and the state to identify gases uh, that are leaked and the risks to people and to the environment, and to introduce the necessary filters, equipment, or other actions to stop leakage. Third question, what is the extent of responsibility and liability of state and non-state actors for the violation of these human rights and for environmental uh, and climate harm caused by these oil and gas extraction techniques? Well, particularly as these fugitive emissions are common, oftentimes the technology utilized presumes that they will emit, while failure to upkeep and monitor equipment will also likely result in leakage. And because company and state actors know or should know about them, both the company and the state are responsible and liable for human rights violations if they do not uh, take the necessary steps to detect leaks and introduce action to stop them. Both companies and states are also liable for not providing information about risks and impacts to workers and local communities who are most likely to suffer these impacts. I will say in both cases, Mexico and Argentina, uh, our travel there with Earthworks and Clean Air Task Force and with the local community was the first time this was ever done. It's the first time they put a FLIR camera up to this uh, equipment. It was the first time anyone knew about this information, about these emissions. So if an NGO can do it, shouldn't the state and shouldn't the company also be doing it? Absolutely. Uh, finally, the last question, what is the extent of responsibility and liability of states and non-state actors, both legal and moral, 
for violations of the rights of nature related to environmental and climate harm caused by these unconventional oil and gas extraction techniques? Well, it is extensive. Uh, we have known for some time now that methane gas leakage is extremely harmful to our atmosphere and can cause up to 100 uh, times or more impacts to climate change trends than CO2. And companies are responsible and liable for these impacts. Uh, th their emissions are causing climate change. And here is a technique and information about something that is occurring that is causing direct impacts to climate change. One of the great challenges that we've had in attributing um, responsibility for climate change to oil and gas companies is that we didn't really have information to pinpoint which emissions are coming from which companies. Well, this, with this information has now changed. We have the technology that allows us to see how much individual non-state actors are actually emitting, and we have the, the evidence to prove that they are contaminating. We can quantify, we can show that this is occurring, and in that way, we can also hold states accountable for not taking measures to control these emissions. Um, a few final uh, links that you can find out more information uh, about these issues. We published a few years back, a UN Guiding Principles on Human Rights and Business uh, Approach to Understanding Human Rights in the Fracking Sector. And we've also prepared an amicus brief, that's very brief, uh, that uh, summarizes some of the arguments presented in this presentation to the panel uh, in the form of, uh, of, a, of an amicus brief document, and you can get that also online. Uh, there has been some press coverage, that, and you're welcome to see those uh, links and consult those uh, press releases. I encourage you to see some of the video footage. It's quite uh, impressive. Uh, it, it is far more impressive than, than the images I've shown here today. Uh, and they, I'm sure, will fully convince you that this is uh, of great concern and something that we need to, to attend to uh, into the future. Our next stop will be Colombia. We'll be working there uh, to do similar field work as we have done in Argentina and Mexico. We will be sharing our findings with local actors there. We will be introducing technology to advocates, to NGOs, and to others that are interested in engaging the sector to hold it accountable. Uh, we will be trying to instill capacity to utilize this for technology. We will try to help local groups acquire these cameras for their own local advocacy, and we are already thinking about and studying potential litigation in places like Argentina, like Mexico, or maybe Colombia, to address not only the risks and the impacts that this is causing to local communities and the state duty and corporate duty to address them, but also looking at climate change uh, or possible climate change litigation to hold companies accountable for their emissions. And with that, uh, I conclude the presentation and I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Daniel, uh, Gil Beringer, um, thank you very much for the w wonderful presentation. And, and you were pres it was uh, most interesting, but to me, very surprising in one aspect. Most of what you said um, is consistent with things that we've heard from other uh, presentations for the last three or four days, um, which is not to say that it isn't valuable. But um, the one thing that, that surprised me was that you were saying that if everybody does the right thing, there'll be no problem. And I find that really difficult to understand. Um, would you like to comment on that? I mean, what I'm talking about is uh, you, your, your uh, several statements about how it can all be fixed, that we have the technology, et cetera, et cetera, and the lease can be stopped, the emissions uh, fugitive and, and intentional. Um, if they're intentional, I, I really don't understand how they can be stopped, but um, the, the fugitive ones, um, I, 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 well, I just find it hard to believe, to be honest. Right. Please comment. Sure. Uh, thank you for this, uh, so, so this comment. This is a fundamental to, to our work and to the reactions we also get locally about what to do with the sector. Uh, first of all, uh, we believe that we should not have a future with fossil fuels. That's our first uh, opinion. 
And today, you know, we have about an 80-20 mix between fossil fuels and renewables, and we'd like to see that over time inverted and eventually uh, have a move that is complete to uh, renewable fuels that are non-contaminating. In the meantime, we do have an oil and gas sector, and that will be with us for a, for a while. Um, in the meantime, there should not be intentional emissions. In the meantime, we need to, to reduce the emissions that are occurring. So while we would love to see all the oil and gas people leave, uh, we, we don't have an immediate solution um, to that problem that can be resolved in, in the short term. So we, at the very least, need the oil and gas sector to stop polluting and killing people. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to say that um, if you fix this, everything's fine. Uh, we would rather hear, you know, you need to fix this right now, and we need to see a plan in the next 50 years where you're phasing out of oil and gas. And we certainly don't want fracking because that's just expanding the horizon. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that we do need to stop the problems that do exist in the sector that can be resolved immediately. Uh, and that will save lives, it will improve health, uh, and it will reduce the impact. So uh, just to come back to that, if, if I guess we have a different idea and, and I'm an innocent abroad here. Um, I, is, I actually normally think of people as not being evil, but <laughs> um, so therefore when, when, I, when I think of intentional emissions, I assume that you were talking about the necessary ones in the, in the process uh, in order to stop pipes from blowing up and so forth. Um, so so uh, I'd, I'd like to have you comment a little bit more on what intentional emissions are uh, so that I will understand how they can be stopped. Um, and the second thing is fugitive uh, emissions, it seems to me very unlikely that they can all be stopped. Um, and, and, and I guess that relates to the, to the point you made, which may or may not be the case, that stopping all these emissions is going to be beneficial for the corporations. I mean, they must be really stupid if they haven't figured that out by now. Um, but yeah, go ahead, please come. Yeah, so, so I try to believe the same thing you do, that people are not evil, but I've run into a few evil people here and there, um, Especially which is unfortunate. <laughs> Boards of directors of corporations. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, you know, I think I think everyone thinks that they're doing the right thing, and some people may be doing the wrong thing knowingly, and and those are the ones that I would consider evil. Uh, yeah. But I think part of the problem with the sector is that this is just how they've done things for a long time, and you know, emitting invisible gases into the atmosphere you get away with because no one sees them, right? And if you didn't really realize how much is being emitted, uh, you might, you know, in, in, in a, a different state of mind than we have today, you might not really care that there's product being lost. In a world now where we're recycling everything and we're, and we're really working on the minimal um, fractions of, of profit that are to be made, it just doesn't make economic sense to emit these gases. Uh, and so, we need, the industry needs to, to realize this. Sometimes the problem is that the amount, even, even if it's a profitable venture to not emit the gases, it may not be that profitable. You know, they, they may only make a very small marginal amount. If there's no incentive to make the company do this, then they're willing to continue emitting uh, unabated. And that's where the regulatory work comes in. Governments, that today, unlike 20 years ago, where they really didn't care what their emissions were, that today have climate change strategies that are aiming to reduce uh, emissions 40, 50% in the next decade or two, uh, they're trying to find where they can reduce. And like I said in one of the slides, the oil and gas sector is one of the major sources of methane emissions uh, for industry. And if that's where you can do your reduction and it's cost efficient, why not do it? As a government regulator, it makes sense. And as a company, uh, you should be willing to comply. And you know, if you're not, then maybe you are evil. Um, so let's and, make let's make room for Maria to ask a sure. question here. I I too. 
No. Are you there, Mark? Please, you and then. No, no, no. I, I said, so let's make room for Maria to ask a question. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> did you apply this camera in United States oil and gas example? Yes, so not me personally, but Earthworks, the organization that uh, took the camera, that owns the camera, they've done about 700 site visits, most of which have been in the United States, some in Canada. And every single time in every one of their site visits, they have found problems. So this is uh, one of the things I said earlier, this is a systemic problem for okay. the oil and gas sector. Some are very bad and some are not so bad, but in almost all cases, they find uh, emissions, whether they're fugitive or intention. Okay, because the fracking hydraulic technology is really very, very bad for environmental and for the people. Thank you. In, in particular, on this point of fracking, uh, because most of the presentation was it, you know, both fracking and, and uh, conventional, but in fracking, uh, at the moment of extraction, there's a lot of loss of gas. When they leave the produced water, um, there's a lot of emissions from, the, from yeah. the water that is exposed to the atmosphere. And then just like in conventional, once they start processing the gas or separating it, that's where a lot of the leakages, the fugitive leaks are going, are going to occur. Okay, thank you. So we have, we, we have to come to a conclusion because of the next presentation, but I wanna just clarify Gil's question a little bit more um, about fracking, about uh, regulating versus banning. Um, that, so this is, this is a human rights court. And so the standards on which they're making judgments are human rights standards rather than regulatory standards. And this court is going to make some recommendations. It's going to have an opinion about things. It's not making a, a binding law ruling or anything. It's, a, it's a establishing an opinion. So if, when you ask this court to make a, a recommendation about the future, are you re recommending to the judges that they urge corporations to regulate and states to regulate better or are you asking the judges to recommend that uh, states ban fracking right so that's a great question and i would say where there is no fracking today i would say no go zone no no more fracking uh, i would be very strong to oppose any expansion of fracking um you know, that's not going to happen in some countries and in some cases. Uh, to tell the Texans not to allow for fracking is going to be a hard sell, um, especially under this government. Uh, so in, in some cases, you may have to go the regulatory path. Uh, a one, one way that regulation can help ban fracking is just to make it so complicated uh, and so expensive that it doesn't make economic sense. That's what we're seeing in Argentina. Fracking is very expensive because they... They don't have all the technology, they don't have all the infrastructure and the know-how to make it profitable. So at $50 a barrel, it's, it's not gonna happen. At 100, it will. And so you know, we have some room there to try to make it more expensive. And if we can do it, maybe that's an indirect way to ban fracking. Well, thank you. Thank you thank very you much. much.